Thank you so much to Dula for being the early vocal on the podcast. For entrepreneurs and founders just starting out, forming a US LLC, a bank account, managing taxes, compliance can be a daunting task. If you're a non-US resident or a first-time founder who lacks the experience, knowledge to navigate the complex legal and financial landscape, it will be impossible for you to do all this. Dula is an auditment platform that simplifies the process of forming a US LLC, setting up a US bank account, and handling taxes, compliance for startups and businesses all over the world. Dula's mission is to democratize access to the US market and empower entrepreneurs to focus on building their businesses without getting bogged down by bureaucracy. If you're building a company, there's no better option out there than Dula.com. So, hey Sadi, sir, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Yes, thank you. I, I think I think let's just get into it. Uh, who is Sadi said? Who are you? Well, I on the prof on the uh, professional side, I am running a venture fund, and I've been doing venture investing in India for since '98, and um, enjoying it thoroughly. Um, just meeting entrepreneurs is amazing. <laughs> And uh, you know they are doing everything new, which perhaps has never been done before. And uh, audacious is an understatement, because what they are trying to change in this world is unheard of in most cases. Um, we invested in a company called KB Colors, and uh, the husband-wife team <coughs> uh, wished to replace chemical colors with colors extracted out of bacteria. And that's an audacious vision. Um, there is a company called Minus Zero. <clears throat> There's a company called Aether, and the list can go on and on and on. So the per, uh, personal side, me, my wife, we have a son, grandchildren, and uh, that keeps me busy. <clears throat> um, I'm a fond wildlife uh, fond reader. And I also collect antique locks. Oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Uh, I think uh, we will take a step back there. We just like go to to the start. So you guys start IDG. It was, it was a long time back where he got anchored by Patrick McGowan uh, from IDG. Uh, <laughs> the, the fund of funds and internal capital really exist at that, exist at that time for VC funds. We started raising domestic capital in 2013, and why is a very simple answer. Um, we were just about to die. Uh, our fund size was smaller; is 95 million dollars compared to 150. So we had we had no track record at that time. Um, we were about to die. Uh, we partnered with a few firms, <clears throat> and fundamentally, if you see, family offices was a big chunk. Family offices wanted to explore the alternative asset uh, business. We actually went through multiple education programs. So we have an education program called Midas, which uh, we must have covered over a f maybe a thousand family offices plus HNIs, ultra HNIs, <laughs> in educating them about venture world. <clears throat> net net today we have $1.2 billion worth of uh, AUM and about 500 has come from India. So that's been a very big game changer for us. And we believe that <clears throat> the tango of International capital and domestic capital is a very big tango. It's a very good, you know, hand in glove tango. Uh, the value add with domestic capital brings is local knowledge of how to grow companies from India and international capital in predominantly governance and <clears throat> how to run VC funds uh, and international knowledge. <clears throat> so this tango has been very, very good and it has been magic for us. Uh, fund by fund, we ra we raise now about fifty percent comes from India. What are like the what are the governmental concerns or regulations about VC funds in India? Have they grown over time, or what what, what does that look? Like? No, I think uh, regulations have got better and more predictable. <clears throat> you know, my belief is that um, in 
let's break it up into international capital and domestic capital. I still believe that 90% of international capital is still waiting outside to come to India in the venture world. That means the bulk of the capital. And these people, you know, a US fund of fund or a US endowment fund uh, they tend to enter private equity first. So many people have entered private equity. But venture is a different beast altogether. So they need to see track records. They need to see a host of other KPIs. Uh, but most important, they need to see, well, basically one is top quartile track records. And the second one <coughs> is predictable government policy. I think in the last four or five years, we've had very good predictable, <coughs> you know, even if, Whatever there are faults in the system right now, even if it is stay put, don't change for the next 10 years. That is predictable government policy. And I think that's more <clears throat> helpful than changing it every or tinkering with it every second day. Um, the the uh, uh, rupee dollar uh, rate is a concern because depreciation takes place. So fund managers in India have to perform better, <clears throat> uh, you know, compared to their uh, people, uh, our, our counterparts in the U.S., as an example, there's a three, four percent difference, and we have a disadvantage. <clears throat> Otherwise, I think we are pretty good right now. I would say there's one or two things which I think need attention, <clears throat> and I would I would raise that to domestic capital. <clears throat> one, domestic capital is taxed at a higher rate than international capital, and then public markets. You know, public markets, the rupee capital magic has worked. It's counter. It's a counterweight to international capital in public markets. In Indian markets, and against, and you know, if you look at public markets, bulk of that money doesn't go into a company. It's on the layer above it. <clears throat> so broadly, public markets don't create new companies, and private markets like us, we create and back new companies. We ourselves have uh, funded 130, uh, and out of that, um, 70 are absolutely doing very well right now. The risk is taken by us. We've exited, we've taken companies public, we've got unicorns, all the standard KPIs. So it's important for the government to look and seriously think, why is capital from India, which is backing new companies, which is a big risk by itself, taxed at a higher rate than public markets and international capital. I think this is very unfair. <clears throat> if capital from India in alternative assets like venture is taxed at the same rate okay, as public markets or international capital, then you will find that Indian capital flows into venture will increase literally three threefold okay and that is very very important there is a lot of idle capital in india real estate i believe is idle capital okay it is illiquid but it is idle capital you don't rotate it as fast uh <clears throat> fixed deposits in my view is idle capital okay so as as families in india get richer the fixed deposits will increase because that's safer. So the only way to challenge the illiquidity of a venture firm is to make it at par. Don't have another tax on it, which is higher than the others. And I think that, that deserves a very, very serious thought. This has been discussed and discussed and discussed for so many years, it is unbelievable. In fact, good thing is that earlier the tax difference was higher. And I think seven, eight years back, uh, the tax difference became half of that lower. <clears throat> but I would I would get this message out that in the next one year, maybe two at best, this should be addressed. Let capital flow from India release itself from the shackles which we have put themselves into. The tax shackle. Why do you think of that? Well, you know, many of these things, I would say even I don't understand. Uh, so at this moment, I will um, I will express ignorance after explanations many times that look I don't understand why it's being carried on, but uh, this is the right time to do it. India is emerging. Actually, India has performed 
in the venture space. <clears throat> and when you see a road and you see bumpers and you see hurdles, I think the job of us and regulators is to say, remove it, remove it, remove it. Okay. <clears throat> and entrepreneurs, if they face some hurdle, we must remove it. So to that extent, um, that's the only thing I have in mind. The rest, I think we'll manage. Do you think the the reason why venture is not that big in India is because it takes a lot of time to return funds, uh, either secondaries or you complete the whole fund cycle ten plus years? What is that reason? It's a long term asset, uh, typically a ten plus one plus one asset, or maybe eight plus one plus one. And <clears throat> you know, it's important to understand, and that's where I say risk is higher, uh, and hopefully the returns are higher. <clears throat> um, to build a company to the first layer of stability, right? It's a five, six, seven, eight year job. It's not a job which can be done in two years. And that to my mind will take time. So I think to the standard venture time frame is 10 years. And if anybody says it must be higher, faster, it's not possible. Okay. So I'm not even giving excuses here. To build a company, it takes time. And let's give it that time. <clears throat> I must say that uh, the capital requirement to build that company is getting lower because India is scaling. And uh, the time required to build that company is also going slower. The reason is, for the first time in my investing experience of 20 years in India, in the last, I would say, six, seven years, uh, especially in the last three years, there's a tailwind which we never used to. There's always a headwind. <clears throat> the tailwind uh, has come from uh, higher growth, <clears throat> higher infrastructure spending, um, a positive environment in the market space, the recognition of startups. But most important, when you build a technology startup and 70-80% of VC money goes into technology, <clears throat> then the 2016 was a very break year when the digital public infrastructure guardrails were set up uh, in terms of digital payments by Nandan and the older government. And the new government did enormously uh, uh, a big job in scaling that to a higher level and using. You know, if you, if you, when we invested in Mintra, there were 10 million credit cards in the country. Okay. That means there must have been maybe 6 million credit card holders in the country. <clears throat> that was 2000, when we exited, sorry, that was 2014, <clears throat> when we sold Mintra to Flipkart. And if you look at today, 40, 50 million credit card holders, 60, 70 million credit cards. <clears throat> On a base of that, you can't build a digital uh, public market, digital uh, economy. <clears throat> UPI today with 300 plus million people and potentially 700 million plus in the next 5 to 7 years is the now infrastructure highway of digital India. <clears throat> it enables 300 million people and entrepreneurs to talk to each other which was never possible and that's very unique about India. That's why if you look at our, <clears throat> our fund 5 thesis which we are raising right now it's very different. It's the whole space of investing in technology is first a company which addresses the population scale framework. It enables us to go to the whole country because the TAM has increased. The TAM theoretically is 300 million people and the TAM theoretically is 700 million people in five to six years, right? From 10 million people. <laughs> Second, we also believe that uh, you can't build a long-term company on just traded products. If Indian, you know, <clears throat> um, if you, the scale of Lenskart is based on 25, 30 million, 30 million consumers. The scale of First Cry is based on, you know, maybe 11 to 15 million consumers. But the scale of Unilever is based on possibly 70, 80 million consumers because they want to generate. <clears throat> okay. So, the point I'm making is when you want to address the 70, 80, 100 million market of people, 
your product has to change, your product design has to change, your pricing and costing has to change. For that, you need a function called R&D in product design. <clears throat> and that investments have to be made. So if you look at, you know, uh, and when I say design manufacturing, it also is whole, the whole space of vertical integration into supply chain and logistics, right? If you take the logistic cost, which used to be 11, 12% of India's GDP, now it's about 7, 8%. <clears throat> Companies can't survive in that. They have to make it 4% and 5% for themselves. So our thesis of investing is deep technology companies, which can achieve population scale frameworks in the country, okay, addressing 7, 800 million people, TAM, <clears throat> in due course of time. And for that, uh, if it's a commerce company and a B2B company, manufacture. So today we have seven factories under our belt across our company. And we have almost 90 subcontracted factories. And we have invested in material science as an example. We've invested in packaging. We've invested in shop floor SOPs to reduce production time by half. Okay. And that is the new India emerging. Because margins from the front end, how much margin you can release is very small. If margins from the front end in a consumer company, okay, which can be released is X, the margin which can be released from the back end is 3X. And on top of that, if you take your products global, then the margin release becomes literally 8 to 10X on the same product. I'm wearing a, a $25 or 1800 rupee glasses from Lenscart. And the same one is sold outside the country, possibly for 50 to $60, right? The cost doesn't go up more than 2x, including shipment. Yeah. The pricing is going up. So that to me is a framework. And we've executed that framework for the last seven, eight years. It's a, it's a key theme for our fund five. And <clears throat> um, incidentally, our revenue of all our active companies, which is about 68 right now, uh, is $3 billion in September. And $700 billion comes from international operations in 15 countries. And it is going to grow. So I think India has changed. It is not changing. India has changed. I must say, what do international investors look at? They look at exits. Um, <clears throat> exits is very important. Uh, and I'll come to the entrepreneur side of it. Uh, at the end of the day, investors come in because they need to have returns, top quartile returns. Um, we have returned now capital 12 years in a row. No other VC fund in the country has done that. We have returned $850 million out of 1.2 AUM, which means we've invested in capital of about 930 million and we've returned 850 million. Hopefully this year, if luck holds out, we would touch a billion dollars worth of exits. Now, trust me, that has taken a discipline approach. It's not about whether exits can be done in India. Exits can be done in India. Okay. And you just need to have a disciplined approach. The disciplined approach is, I remember sitting around computers, working from home during COVID times. And we said, you know what? This year exits are not going to take place. And I said, no, 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 we should return. We should have a tick mark. We can't let one year go by. During the COVID year, we returned $10 billion. A good tick mark. So if you make up your mind to have exits under your belt, then exits can be done. Uh, is that the reason why you guys started the growth fund? Growth fund reason is very different. A VC firm, typically holding periods are seven to eight years, average holding periods, maybe nine years. But we found that many of our companies are scaling so massively. And after a C round, maybe at best in some companies a D round, we have shareholding patterns. Okay. Where the company is doing absolutely beautiful. We've done the hard work, but we don't have capital to invest in them. So we said it's logical for us to raise a growth fund, which can now enjoy the fruits of labor for the first seven to eight years. And of course, with the right governance, you know, somebody else leading the transaction, we should put money into our companies. There's no question about it. So it is more like an opportunities fund, but it also set the base for our future vision which is we are a multi-asset private investor. And the first is the VC series. And the second, this is the seed for the growth series. So effectively, we do not want only other people to get the fruits of labor 
of companies which are growing and they are stable and they are growing to leadership positions. Many, we have a list of seven IPOs lined up in the next seven years, right? How would we ever tap that? So I think the growth fund is a very selfish reason. We just want to enjoy the fruits of labor for the VC fund for the sort of seven, eight years. Our strategy is to build growth fund, which will invest in new companies also. And our next growth fund will do. Has that discipline that you have used in the uh, early stage funds, the five funds, has that helped you in raising money for the growth fund? Oh, absolutely. Uh, interestingly, our growth fund was 95% Indian capital. We closed it. We were oversubscribed by 34%. And we did not uh, basically go outside the country. There's... Uh, two uh, investors outside the country. <clears throat> one of them new, one of them from our existing portfolio, <clears throat> existing LP base. Otherwise, we didn't actually, we, we closed it in a very fast time frame. And that was magical because uh, this was in the early part of 2023. Um, I think we just closed it in six months time frame. When you have the discipline of exit, uh, you need to make sure that your fundraising cycles go down and they are going down. Um, but fundraising in a VC can't be a large fund all the time. I think we have to see the markets. We have to be, we have to be disciplined about exits. We have to be disciplined about investing, valuations. And most important, this is the financial side of the KPIs, okay? Because yeah. my customer here is my investor. But there's an entrepreneur. <laughs> and the question then comes in is, how do, you, how do you tell an entrepreneur that, look, I'm the best VC in the country and I must you must take my uh, capital because I think I can add value. And I've always addressed my team in saying, the day you put money and sign a check, your leverage is lost. You have to prove every day that A, you, you means me, and the firm Chirate is worthy of sitting on the board of that entrepreneur. We have to prove that every day. There is nothing called, you know, we are Chirate and we are the greatest. And because if you have a good reputation, by the way, uh, expectations of value add on the board shoot up. And um, that's been my philosophy for a long, long time. And I believe that that's uh, something which our team members practice every day. Prove to the entrepreneur we are worthy of sitting on the board. Be entrepreneur friendly. Guide him. Be the mentor. Be, you know, being an entrepreneur is very lonely. Okay? Uh, when you are... When you're going into the market at a young age, by the way, okay? <clears throat> Imagine 23 to 27 is your age group. Our oldest entrepreneur would be 30. At that young age, you're fighting a market. Again, as I said, new business model, new revenue model. Everything is new, right? And then you're also raising capital. <clears throat> um, it's a very lonely world. It's a very lonely world. And the number of no's which an entrepreneur gets is far higher than the number of yeses. Just to give you an example, we typically see three, three and a half thousand deals a year and we invest in maybe 12 to 14. But the rest is no. Okay. So I think the, the biggest service we can do is give credit to the entrepreneur that he knows his business, he or she knows the business. Uh, help him, you know, just go through that maze of challenges which he will face and not just be prescriptive about what that person should do because it's something new. And I think we learn from entrepreneurs. We listen to entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have to listen with humility, not because we have capital. We just, just listen to and bring the collective experience of having met so many companies, right? So that that collective experience without violating IP, of course, is something that we bring to the table at every stage of the scaling of that company. Long answer to your short question. Do, do, do founders in India really have that leeway to choose who to raise money from that you're doing? You know, net, net at the end of the day, okay, at some stage they will, whether it's a seed stage or a pre-series A or A round, at some stage they will have because the number of VC firms are also higher. So I would say uh, at, at the the... the Difficulty of raising capital when you're in the conceptual framework is higher. It means seed stage or when you're raising angel money. As you grow higher, number of VC firms are um, are many in the country. 
But I must say that <laughs> um, though the number of VC firms are much higher than perhaps five years ago or six years ago, I think the ability of these VC firms or the willingness to VC firms to uh, fund any new model has gone. Now select companies are getting funded. Those who are, are you know, who are going to consume less capital, those who have a real plan and not a fuzzy logic plan, it's becoming tougher for entrepreneurs to raise capital. There is no question about it. <clears throat> and the reason for that, I must tell you, and this is my own reading. If you look at the five years, <clears throat> if you look at all the VC firms which have been investing for the last maybe 10, 15 years, they are the same. So let's assume there is on a scale of 10, right? Their investments in India have been at a, at a, gradient of 15-20% increase per annum, but broadly that's line A. In the last, except for last year, the years previous to that, there were about 7-8 transient funds who came in. They came in and they used to say, oh, you know what, I think I'm going to put $20 million. And then values is shot up. That transient fund period has gone. Okay. Those firms have gone, except one or two are still there, but they are now back to the normal. Firms used to invest $100 million are now putting in 30 in the private equity space. Firms used to put $10 million are putting in 5 in the VC space. So the I think the absence of transient funds is a very big boon to the VC world because they used to distort the normal. Okay? Though there was a lot of capital, the number of deaths was also very high. Today, you will see what I call God-fearing entrepreneurs and God-fearing VCs, right? Who are funding companies and taking calculated risks. The entrepreneur no longer needs to, I mean, I've been telling entrepreneurs, you don't need to grow at 150% per annum forever and ever and keep burning capital, okay? You can, you can grow at 70% per annum and not burn capital. It's okay because you're in a marathon. You're not in a sprint. Neither the VC is in a sprint. Neither the... So many VCs followed that because there was these transient funds who came in. And by the way, transient funds have left. So this is a very good time to build companies with money which is available at all layers. And But that money doesn't come easy. It comes for good business plans. But, but if you restrict the amount of money uh, that is going towards the... Uh, like deep tech, if I take the general example, uh, doesn't that only help in the growth of consumer companies that like 100 million ARR SaaS or that you might say? The innovation, isn't that really affected by it? No. Best innovative companies have ever during downturns. Okay. So, look, I think just the availability of oodles of capital doesn't mean that company will be a success. We have seen in our own country so many examples, right? To build a company is a science, is an art, is a thoughtful process of a group of people which includes the entrepreneur, which includes the investor, which includes well-wishers, which includes the supply chain, which includes the consumer. Focus on the consumer. Focus on the B2B customer. Right? I think getting back to the old days of the, the old world way of building business, but at a faster pace using risk capital, will stay. Will stay. Okay? There's no need to plunder money and, and uh, invest and just keep burning. Uh, we are Indian entrepreneurs. I'm an Indian entrepreneur because, you know, we're a VC firm, but we're an entrepreneur. And I can tell you, capital is not available on a tree. We have to raise it. It's a tough job. And I think entrepreneurs are also facing that tough job. But the successful entrepreneurs, you will see actually more companies lasting longer than three years back. Now, we are thinking that so out of our companies, you know, how many will go public? How many we think will last 20, 30 years? How many will last 50 years? As a VC, I'm thinking of that right now, which is why we start the growth fund. We want to take that journey. Right? Is, but is there really a scarcity of capital or just 
people no, are... No, it's not a scarcity of capital. Capital is there, but it's choosy. Choosy towards what? Like, what are you looking at? I mean, because the venture market outside of India, if you talk about the West, Europe, or the US as a whole, they have a lot of money and they can they have the leeway to blow a lot of money at different things, not whether it works or not. Not today. Do you we, also have it, we also have a leeway to, uh, to take risk. But let's be clear. Um, as a VC, I have a KPI. Loss ratios. Yeah. I will take risk. Okay. And that's in the seed stage. We are willing to we invest 10% of our capital. That's a high risk. You look at the companies which people like us have invested. Okay. Uh, chemicals. There does not exist a similar company extracting color or a bacteria anywhere in the world in powder form. Anywhere in the world. Ether. At that price point, that intelligence, there does not exist a intelligent, self-learning upper prosthetic. If you look at Miko, which is a companion robot for children, attempting to create an Apple-like ecosystem for children on a global basis, there does not exist a company like that. If you look at Minus Zero, yes, there exists Tesla, but they think their technology is better. I like that. We can't invest in Tesla. We have to invest here. Um, if you look at our agricultural companies, Cropin, Right, managing 44 million acres of land through satellite imagery, okay, and managing uh, in a and getting revenue on a sales basis with the data they have, there does not exist a company in that space. So I think across the VC firms in the country, and I'm taking our own examples because I'm more familiar with it. You will find that investors, VCs in the country, are taking enormous risk. And it's not right always to compare with what happens in the U.S. U.S. has a longer history of VCs. We have to be contextual in nature. <clears throat> okay. By the way, performances of funds are increasing compared to previous funds, uh, selectively, depending on the VC. And the reason for that is very simple. Technology investments are getting higher. Right. Um, if I look at just our seed capital, <clears throat> which is there, technology investments in the fund four would be 50% higher than fund 3. Fund 5 would be even higher. That means we are taking more risk. Uh, how does the... Con uh, why, why, do you, why are we taking the contextual experience into note here? How, this is how, India. How is that? Anybody who copied the US model into India, okay. right? Uh, many companies did not succeed. Please understand, uh, VCs did not fund a lens card in the US. We did here. VCs did not fund a baby care company in the US. We did here. Okay? Yeah, VCs did fund a Mintra equivalent in the US, but we did here also. And now it's a $3 billion company. So, I think the time has come to say that, you know, Indian VCs have done some things which are successful in India in the context of India, building on UPI as an example, right? Yeah. And did innovations in India, like cash on delivery, please understand Mintra, for a long time, could not raise capital because the international investors said, I don't believe in cash on delivery. It's never happened. Okay. So those are small, small things which happened in the transient manner, which people like us sold. But innovations, agility, technology, uh, the presence of uh, digital public infrastructure. Now we're getting into manufacturing. Time not to say this is happening in the US and we are not doing it. I think it's time to say Indian companies have done some things and some is not a small number. Which is which is now creating a benchmark globally, right? India is creating barriers which are competitive in nature on its own by entrepreneurs, which China did on a regulatory manner. Okay, and it's a free market. That's a different buzz altogether. With the incredible company that the country is producing, uh. How's your the competitiveness in the venture market as VC firms with global firms that have set up arms in nation? I think it's very good. <laughs> okay. I've always believed that an open market is a competitive market. It will bring out the best in entrepreneurs. And we are the only firm who's returned capital in 12 years, $850 million. Our cash return to AUM is 
or cash return to invested capital is 95%. You tell me who has done this. So again, I'm not being cocky, but I think there are so many firms, Indian VC firms, right, who are doing so well. They are entrepreneurs in their own right. Uh, international capital is here to stay. So is domestic VCs. Incidentally, I must tell you, <clears throat> uh, India <clears throat> invested in the last um, five years $280 billion in both private equity and VC. Okay. <clears throat> now, out of that, Indian fund managers invested approximately $70 billion, 70 out of that. The Indian fund manager private equity share was above 60%. Indian fund manager uh, VC share was 46%. Give it another 10 years, you will find the Indian fund manager share of investing go up to 75%. And the reason is because you have to be local. You have to know. Cash on delivery is a very good example. Every private equity guy said, you know what? No credit cards. I'm going. Okay? We solved the problem along with Mintra. First cash on delivery, cash pickups for every four days, then three days, then two days, then once in two days, uh, once, twice in a day, and then thrice in a day. Okay? There was no UPI. Uh, but well, uh, but the I is it the competition between different VCs or VC firms as individuals or between Indian VCs versus global VCs with arms in the country? No competition. The market is so large. But I must tell you, our valuations of our companies put together, 3 billion, is at 17 billion. And in 12 billion of that value created, there is no international VC fund. And I believe that, and again, this is not a, you know, versus the other. I believe Indian yeah. VC are taking higher risk than global returns. Because the global VCs are still influenced broadly by what happens outside the country. Okay? I don't care. I want to see whether there's a KB coal here or an ether here or a minus zero here, right? And I want to see if they're solving problems in India. And if they can solve problems in India, trust me, they can solve problems anywhere in the world. Why do you think that? Because uh, Indians build companies uh, at a frugal level. Uh, their pricing points are lower because Indians don't pay higher prices. Okay. I think there are many examples in technology where Indians are doing it at first attempt and at a cost which is cheaper because that's the amount of capital which is available. So that also rule applies to the entrepreneur. The number of companies which are going global from India today, okay, in the technology space is shorter. <clears throat> and many companies were moving out of the country. Today they are wanting to stay back because India is a big market. SaaS I think is still a problem because Indian CIOs don't pay the, the <laughs> price. Um, so sad, we have to think about what to do with that. Um, but uh, this is, I think in the venture space, um, the best is to come yet. <clears throat> because by now, many of our companies have grown to a scale which I could not even think three years back. And COVID, <clears throat> you know, let, let's be very clear. If I look at the last three years, entrepreneurs did immensely well. You know why? They faced COVID. They faced a war. Then they faced the logistics and supply chain issues in China. And of course, now you know what's happening. 70% <clears throat> of our companies, of our entrepreneurs, which we are invested in, came out better post that than pre-COVID. 70%. <clears throat> okay? Today, more than 55% of our companies do not need capital. So if I look at last year... <clears throat> Our capital raised by our companies was $330 million. Okay? And secondary transactions was $750 million. So totally transacted capital in Jirate portfolio companies was a billion dollars. The year before that, the primary capital 
was a billion dollars and the secondary capital was a billion dollars, two billion. Okay. Yeah. The year before that was 1.7. Now, one narrative which could come back is, you know what, companies could not raise capital. <clears throat> and that's why the primary capital dropped from $700 million in 2022. In 2023, it dropped to $330 million. The answer is no. The burn rate was cut by entrepreneurs. More companies are generating cash. And the runway has increased. They don't need more money. Right? Most important, the total treasury in our companies is now over a billion dollars. They don't need money. Okay. So please understand, this will be holding good for the Indian VCs and the global VCs, where the quality of KPIs and the quality of operations have shot up by Indian entrepreneurs. And they have done tremendously well under the stress of the last three years. Yeah. <clears throat> how have you, how has the VC from the Jirata as a whole, how have you guys emerged post-COVID, pre-COVID? Uh, I think many of our people said we don't want to come back to office. <laughs> and now they are saying we don't want to go back home. I'll pivot here a little bit. Um, what does your LP concentration rate look like? Like how much of it is how much of it is in university endowments from the from international markets, fund of funds, family offices? What is the distribution rate? Uh, we have fund of funds. We have uh, we have no endowments. Really, uh, overall endowments have a different genre, different way of investing. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, DFIs. We have corporates, um, and uh, family offices. That's our, uh, you know, it's pretty evenly spread across all these. <clears throat> if I take away India as an example, just, you know, <clears throat> the international poll is fairly equal uh, amongst all these classes. <coughs> From India, we have uh, family offices. <clears throat> the largest family office from India, we manage more than $100 billion um, overall. Uh, we have uh, corporates like uh, State Bank of India. We have Sidby. Um, so yeah, it's in India's Indian capital <clears throat> is here to stay. It's intelligent capital. It's uh, it, it needs servicing. It needs a lot of conviction, convincing because all the Indian fund family offices and ultra high net worth individuals they're doing public market, private markets, real estate. So you're you're back in India. But what I like is that many of the Indian investors they want to spend time with us and our companies and help them support and grow. So there's a there's a big pool of mentors which are available as Indian capital. Big pool. At what point did you really uh, you've been in the system since '98? At what point did you see the family offices really get or look towards venture as You know, <clears throat> uh, I was toying with the idea of Indian capital <clears throat> in 2002. Because my first set of one and a half million commitments across two attempts was from India. <laughs> because they didn't have access to international capital. Uh, but seriously, it started in 2013. <clears throat> because um, we had a need. And um, there, were, there were angel investors who had already done 10, 20, 30, 40 angel deals. And they were feeling the need to have a, <clears throat> uh, a firm come in. Because it was, it's difficult for an angel investor to manage 40 deals. <clears throat> and some of our early investors, uh, Manish Choksi <clears throat> uh, of the Asian Paint Group, Chris Kopalakrishnan, um, the Bangur family. <clears throat> I think we have a lot to thank them for. Uh, because they not only invested in us, they believed in us. Uh, but they also literally, you know, handheld us. <clears throat> uh, and they spent a lot of time with our companies. At the end of the day, the entrepreneur needs every single advice or operating help they can get. And that's what we are fortunate to get from the Indian investors and the global investors. <laughs> did, uh, why do you think did the family offices really believe or invest in you? Please. Look, in any, um, in any group of people or group of 
<laughs> now, investors, if I may say this time, there's always a bell curve. There is this 15% who are early movers. And I think we were lucky to meet the 15%. Uh, now that 15% has become maybe 25%. Uh, but we also carried on an education program, as I said. We have a very strong program with CII. <coughs> Every quarter, uh, CII and Chirate get together with about 25 family offices and ha and holds a one-and-a-half-day program on alternative assets. So there's a lot of education involved. It's not uh, it's not just going and selling, if I may say. <coughs> uh, and I must say, we have uh, we have two very strong partners who have helped us in this journey. Uh, one is ASK and the other is Kotak. We work with them extensively in the market uh, because <clears throat> as wealth managers, they know the market. And together, we have also uh, done education programs and onboarded investors from India. It's a wonderful relationship with both Kotak as well as ASK. Right. Should, Indian, uh, should Indian fund managers, where should they raise money from if they were to? I think the, there are corporates, there are insurance companies right now, and there is SIDBI, <clears throat> there are family offices, ultra high net worth individuals. I think the market is much more open right now. Awesome. I think I think this has been incredible. Uh, the last question which I usually like to end with, I've been into startups and VCs since 2011. What do you think is one fact that will blow 11-year-old me my VC? I think we have to, no, uh, my wife, Chalni, is heading our foundation. <clears throat> and she's running a micro-entrepreneurship program. We just, <clears throat> Saturday and the, and the Saturday before that, uh, we screened uh, and selected out of a total of 50, 14 entrepreneurs. <clears throat> okay? Yeah. And I'll give you an example and then give you an answer. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> It is not necessary that an 11-year-old think of technology alone. It depends on who you are. If you're in Raichu <laughs> and your parents, and this is a live example, and your parents are selling guavas, okay? This entrepreneur we funded yesterday <laughs> from the family office, the Sethi family office, and he was earning 25,000 rupees net with his mother on one cart. He comes with a business plan and says, <clears throat> I need money to uh, have two more carts, which will give me total now 75,000 rupees a month, one for my brother, one for me. And they will be placed in three locations. Right? <clears throat> Please understand. It is con Entrepreneurship is contextual in nature. So for a kid, who's, you know, 11 may be a bit young, but, <clears throat> um, and th I think this, this kid was in the third year of undergrad. <clears throat> He's been earning money for his family who needs money. Okay. <clears throat> for three years now. And he's come up with a business plan. And by the way, by the way, all he needed, all he needed to get this plan off the ground over a one-year period is 25,000 rupees. Now, let's come down from this haloed world of the VC, right? Which is technology and valuations and come down to a Raichur boy who we are funding through the foundation and <clears throat> he will now earn 75,000 rupees a month instead of 25,000 rupees a month. Okay? No technology, just selling kuavas. And he gave me the KPIs of <clears throat> how he plans to sell guavas. And he gave me the uh, losses uh, in terms of, and I asked him, I said, why do you, my wife asked him, why do you uh, do guavas? Why can't you, when you're taking a card, sell mangoes? He said, no, no, no. Guavas last for four days. They don't get spoiled in one or two days. That's why I only focus on guavas. Now, now you may think this is ridiculous. It's not. There is millions of entrepreneurs who are building small businesses in the country and we are fortunate to have funded now 15 plus 7 earlier 22 okay through our family foundation and I'm telling you those will never be Lenskart and you know the big ones 
but they will give employment to more people in the country than any of the VCs put together. <clears throat> so, yeah. I'm giving a different answer because I think it deserves a different answer. Right? Okay. Thirdly, the, the VCs are funding 1% of the educated population. Yeah. Okay? There's yeah. one percent. We are the high income and so on and so forth. We are 1%. Not even that. There's a world which is 99%. Definitely. Awesome. I think this has been incredible. Uh, I learned a lot from this one and I think yeah. it gave me a lot of different insights. Uh, that's it for my saying thing you'd like to say. No, Advik, thank you and uh, <clears throat> I wish you all success. If there's anything else we can do, we'll be happy to do so. For you.